Hello everybody, John here, and today on To The Garage, I'm going to tackle one of the parts of this big beautiful beast. This is a Jaguar XJ X358, um, that scares most people off of them. And this is the same with Land Rovers, Range Rovers, Audis, etc. as well. And that is, I've had a fault code on the dash, a little error message that says, air suspension fault which is enough to make most people run an absolute mile. And whilst it can be troublesome and it can be expensive, mostly it's a relatively cheap, relatively easy DIY fix on these things that the majority of people just give to a dealer to do. And then it becomes rather expensive. So I'm gonna fix that on this car, I hope, and take you on the journey. For those of you as yet unaware of the channel, not the regular subscribers, my name is John and this channel is all about doing things that are interesting and fun in your garage. I have a huge bias towards Jaguars, I love them, particularly the XK8. Uh, this is my daily driver, blue, and this XJ is what we're going to be playing with today. I am not a mechanic, I have never been a mechanic. I am what they call an enthusiastic amateur. I do know a fair amount about cars and come along on a journey. Everything I'm showing you is my experience, it's my opinion, and if you want to follow that, that's up to you. So there are many things that can go wrong with the air suspension on your car. Um, right up to the air strut itself, the air spring or the air bag that holds the car up, leaking. Um, it can be the ECU, the little brain that controls everything. And those two items, yep, yeah, they're quite expensive. You need to, if you can't fix it yourself the way I'm going to show you, you need to diagnose those or get them diagnosed and get them replaced. Simple as that. The other issues with these vehicles tend to be leaks from pipes where they go into the air springs or out of the compressor or into the cylinder. They tend to be the little sensors that detect how high the car is. Uh, my car has three of them and most cars most Range Rovers, most Audis would have four of those. And they can go a little bit squiffy. But what I'm going to look at, and I'm making a huge assumption because it is so likely, is the compressor that pumps up the air has lost its oomph and is no longer doing a good enough job. So what are the reasons I think it's that? A, it's the most common thing to go wrong with them in my experience. B, it's showing the classic symptoms. And that is... The car rides and drives beautifully. It doesn't appear to be sitting low. I'm not coming out to it in the morning and found that it's sat on its belly or that it's leaning over to one side. All that happens is sometimes, and not all of the time, when I start it up, I'm getting this error message. And what that error message can be is in two minutes, after starting the car, the car was unable to reach the required height. And that is a classic sign of a compressor that's working away, but it's not quite doing enough. It's not putting enough air in the tank. So what we're going to do today is take the compressor off, have a look at it and replace the piston ring. In essence, it's a little rubber ring, but the piston ring and the seal on that compressor. So the parts I'm using, um, the supplier was actually recommended to me by one of our super subscribers on this channel and is worth subscribing to the channel if for nothing else for the comments we get and to use the website because we've got all sorts of useful info. And this is what it is, this is a memorable name for you. Bagpiping Andy's Compressor Repair Kit. I love that name. A. Bagpiping. Scottish. B. Bagpiping. Um, in the world of air suspension, your springs are usually called bags. Bagpiping Andy's Compressor Repair Kit. Love it. Um, so you get this pretty decent little um, manual showing you how to do the repair, the service, call it what you like. 
and you'd get the key parts. This is actually all you need. So the thick ring here is actually the piston ring, but it is the main reason we're doing this job. And these two are sealing rings on what is effectively the, the cylinder head. Um, and we'll need those because we're going to disturb it. There's two in there because there's two different models of compressor fitted and you just select the right one. You also get some cable ties and the correct bolts to replace the ones you're taking out with the uh, thread lock already applied to them. And there's even a tap to clear out the threads so we can do this job properly. So very complete, not too expensive, came quickly and it's got great instructions, what's not to like. So this job is reasonably easily uh, conducted with the jack and axle stands. I've got a lift which just makes it a lot easier to do and also makes it easier to film. The compressor is just above here, so I need to undo this under tray. Basically a series of 10mm bolts if you're working on the same car as me. pegs in the middle out which effectively collapses them like a raw wall plug And here is the unit in question in all its glory. It's just suspended on rubber buffers from three bolts. One there, one there, and one just out of sight here. But easy to get out from underneath. We have an electrical connection here and an airline connected here. There's also a connection here, which I believe is the air temperature. And there's a rubber hose just connected there where it takes its air in from. So while we have the liner out, let's take the tour. So here we are. So that's the compressor, the item we're looking at. That is the mounting for the front subframe here. Mine still feels nice and pliable, so chances are that's not original, which is good. Here we have one of the three sensors on my car that tell the car how high it is and therefore adjust the air suspension. We've got the back of the headlight up there. We've got wiring loom running above us along with some air conditioning pipes. The top there you've got a good view of the strut or uh, bag or air suspension unit, insert your preferred term. In this corner, a lot of pipe work for the um, 
air conditioning system and also for the fuel this is an important pipe that's the drain tube from this well above here to allow rainwater and anything else that gets in there to get away here we have the very unusually shaped water bottle and down here is the pump and this is a sound deadening bag and on these cars and the X351 there's a lot of these sorts of things in various places I'll just take it out for you literally a plastic bag with a sound deadening foam in it and the reason for this is there's a lot of open hollow channels in the aluminiumly constructed cars and you get sound that booms along them and can cause road noise big increases in road noise because of the sort of pipe organ type construction of some of the sections in the car so if you find little bags like that they do need to be there otherwise your road noise will go up massively Here you can see a little deflector that basically stops anything getting near any of the pipe work. We've disconnected the battery, so now we can disconnect these wires. There we go. That's off. There's another connector going into the temperature sensor down here. So I'm just Doing the same with that. And that one's off too. There's the air pipe coming up here. Just have a look what size that is. I'm guessing eight or nine. Feels like nine. You can hear the air leaking. I'm just going to let that leak. We've got these bolts here, which are long tanks. Ah, I was right in the first place. It was a 10, just need a long reach 10. So a deep socket. Shall I take the nut all the way off? Because I've still got that airline attached. I'll show you these fittings better when we're off. So just finishing taking the airline off. That's the little bit I took out. So when I'm doing the bolts, I've just got this air intake, a little air filter there, to disconnect. That's just a little bit too tough for me to do by hand. But I don't think I'll have to get my proper ear retractor on it. quite a soft rubber pipe so you can kind of roll it back there we go that's off so now I'm just gonna hold the weight whilst I remove one whoops that fell out of there so there's a rubber and a spring underneath here, so that goes like that. Whoop. Uh, 
and we're out. This is the top of the unit. Here's the bottom and bolts were coming through these little top hat washer and it's hanging on these rubbers and springs. Just take that one out before I lose it. This is where the air is sucked in. Goes to the compressor. Two points. And this is where the air line goes in. That's where the air temperature sensor plugs in. And that's where the motor power plugs in. So, our job now is just to remove the top. This is kind of the crucial view. Behind here is a little crankshaft. There's a piston on a conrod and the fins, cooling fins are the clue. That's the cylinder head. And we need to take these two bolts out, which are Torx fittings, and remove this cylinder head so that we can get out the piston and its piston ring. Okay, so, big issue with this so far has been that bolt comes undone that bolt the head is stripped it's a t30 torx um very soft metal not pleased at all with the quality of those so <clears throat> i'm gonna do my best to get it out it's been soaking overnight with penetrant but i'm not feeling very hopeful about it Next, plain steel nut. I'm going to see if I can weld this onto the top. At a minimum, it'll shear the head off. What should happen here is that I've now got great leverage, but it could easily shear the head off the bolt, or more likely, if I'm honest, the material the bolt is made of is poor and it's just gonna rip straight back off again. Now, material is just too poor. Right, next we left-handed drill bit, which we'll try drilling the head, and it may rip it out as it bites, but again, I feel that the material is too soft, really poor quality stuff. So it's probably not gonna do anything other than chew the head.
There's a head off. Now with the head off, that should mean, and I'll remove this other side, we can lift off the cylinder head. That's the uh, bolt I've taken out. There is an air pipe here that connects the top to the bottom and you just push the flange around it and pull it out. Like a lot of uh, quick fit plumbing fittings around the house. I'll show you that when we're off. So what we need to do now is just shock this a little bit and hopefully pull it up and leave the bolt sticking up. Even with the head off the bolt, it's still holding on well. Um, and in some ways that's good. That means it's probably frozen into here rather than the threaded section at the bottom. Um, I can get a little bit of movement, as you can see, I think, but not a lot. So one thing you can do, here's the bolt. If I can get something thin in this gap here, like the tip of this old nail file, then by tapping here, I'm pulling up. And I think you can see we're getting a tiny gap. And back again. This time I'll try and put a wider bit further forward. There we go. Right, we are 15 minutes later now, and we've got that much gap. Using that little uh, stainless nail file as leverage, just tapping, knocking, more penetrant, a little bit of heat, etc. etc. Now at the point where I think this piece of cutlery might uh, be the job so again I'm just going to pop it in here I'm not going to lever and ruin the surfaces what I'm going to do is just jam this in and keep twitching this and moving it around until it comes up a little a bit higher as soon as I can get it clear enough and pack it out with some tape I'll do a little bit of levering with a, a, a plastic crowbar in effect well finally got it off um, I'll have to see if we can get that pin out now, but just taking a moment to celebrate. <laughs> 
So there's the piston and the piston ring, which will be at full. There's the bore of the cylinder. It's tapered bore. Um, and there's a little flap or reed valve on top of the piston. Yeah, so now I'm just going to clean this stuff up. And then pull that stud out, he says, hopefully. And then the rubber ring here is what we replaced from the kit and the piston ring around the piston. And the piston just rocks back and forwards. It doesn't have a top gudgeon pin. <sighs> so I've left that soaking for a good while. Also warmed up the casting just down here. Uh, let it cool, put some more penetrant on and uh, I'll just attach some mole grips as tightly as I can. They're not actually made by mole, so stop calling them that. It's like calling every hoover a hoover, and all hoovers are vacuum cleaners. Oh, I'm detecting a little bit of movement. This is very good news after all this. Come on. I keep twitching it, yes. Right. Just gonna re-soak that, not push my look. This is gonna come out. Yay! <laughs> oh, this is such a relief. Because I kind of reached a point of no return with this. I've either scrapped it or this is coming out. Yeah. That's going to be stiffer as it comes out. That'll be a little bit of thread at the bottom that's exposed pulling into the hole. So, give that a little bit of lube. There's no point pulling so hard that you um, make the grip slip because once they start slipping, you start spalling the metal and then there's nothing to grip. Right, there we go. Okay, I'm going to get that off camera because I need both hands. But we're in business. There we go. Finally got the thing out. Here it is. So it was frozen here rather than on the thread. So shows you you should put a bit of copper grease on the plane areas of your bolts when they're going through holes for uh, reasonable fits. Right, so I've started cleaning this thing up. Uh, just one thing I wanted to share. On this surface, which is a mating surface with a seal, um, we definitely don't want to scratch it. So I've got some cutlery, literally. It's a stainless steel knife from X from the kitchen. And this surface has basically got aluminium oxide on it. So all you want to do is use the back of the knife, which is nice, flat, straight, and it's got no, no cutting edge on it whatsoever um, to scrape the aluminium oxide off the surface. Okay, it's taken me an unreal amount of time to get to this point, but we're now ready to rebuild this. So uh, just to give you a little overview, this is the top that I had all that trouble taking off. And basically it's the cylinder head. Um, this pot is where the piston pushes into and there's a hole just at the back there. I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, it's a slightly tapered bore and is in very good condition. I've got to say very smooth, very lovely. It's not intended to be lubricated, so don't do that. It's got this ring on. I've obviously popped it just back on for effect. Uh, it's an O-ring. That is going to be disposed of, and I've cleaned out the groove with a little bit of wire wool and cleaned up this surface with the back of my stainless steel bit of cutlery and cleaned it off with alcohol, and it's all nice and smooth. This bit is a dryer. It just basically contains, no, I can't really hear it, um, some granules of drying agent. I haven't got a new one, so I'm not going to disturb it. But this is essentially the motor. 
it looks like a starter motor. Um, there's an air intake filter just here. And here is the piston that does all the work. And on the upstroke, it compresses the air into that cylinder head. And on the downstroke, this little reed valve flaps open and allows air to get this side, but it's drawn up through the crankcase of the uh, piston. And that's supplied with clean air via this pipe. There's a six millimeter tap comes with the kit. And it, as you've seen from all the grief that I've gone through getting these things out, this is not something you want to skimp on. This tap wrench is something I made when I was an apprentice. Although in aluminium you're not going to get too much of a problem. Remember, turn it forward. One. Back a couple. Just keep breaking off the swarf. Don't let it build up. But as we're cleaning the thread rather than cutting it, and it's aluminium, you shouldn't really be getting too much of a problem. Just doing a check. This is the good bolt I removed. This is the new bolt. And if you mesh the threads, like so, and look up to the light and see if they truly do mesh. Excuse me for a second. Yep. And you know it's the same pitch. Uh, I was wondering by the amount of rubbish that came out, is this uh, a different pitch and that's why I've been given a bolt? But no, it's the same pitch. All right, I'm going to drop our new seal in. The kit contains two seals. See, the one with the sort of dog leg on it is for a different year of pump. That sits in there, makes everything nice and airtight. Next, we're going to be taking off this piston ring, and you need to look at this little roll pin that stops it rotating so that you orientate the new uh, ring in exactly the same way. There is a square corner here, and there is a round corner here, and you need to get them the right way round and position that pin correctly. So you remove this just by stretching it over the end of the piston. There we go. And there it is. So the right orientation is that angle, the right angle sits next to the roll pin and the radius does not. See a little piston action there if I work it. But no uh, gudgeon pin at the top. So this changes angle as it goes up and down, hence this thing has got kind of a radius edge. Here's a new piston ring. Be going on that way up. I'm just going to pop him over. Stretching him the absolute minimum to get him on. There we go. Now, in its relaxed form, this is too big to go into the cylinder head. So you want to encourage it down in size and you may have to maneuver it into the cylinder head. With this in the up position, turn in this over. Make sure your O-ring is still in the right place. Squeeze your piston ring till it goes inside the head. And position everything in the correct orientation. There we go. Very easy. And then using the new bolts, 
which have got thread lock on. These are uh, five mil hex or Allen bolts. And in terms of doing these up, there's a nine newton meter torque, but basically that's not very tight at all. The O-ring is doing all the work and the thread lock should stop them from coming undone. Now, just gonna reconnect this airline, which I disconnect, disconnected um, to give me a bit more space. Just a push connector, like domestic push fittings. This is the hole where the airline goes from this compressor to your cylinder. So that's the one that attaches it to the car. pushes in and then I took two bolts at this bracket again just to improve my access I'll put them back right essentially that's it rebuilt Some cable ties uh, for different models, not necessary on this really. You may have to cut some cable ties to get wires and pipes out of the way, but not on this car. I gave these a lick of paint. I haven't tidied them up too much. Well, painful job, but only because of that um, frozen bolt. As I always say, it's rounded off nuts and bolts and waiting for parts that makes most jobs difficult. Um, I'm going to refit that now, but it's just the reverse of what you've already seen. So thanks very much for watching this. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, not sponsored in any way, but I really recommend uh, that little repair kit. Uh, Bag Pipe in Andy's Compressor Repair Kit. It was recommended to me by one of our subscribers who'd used it. And um, yeah, turns out very useful. There's even a little diagram there showing the internal workings of the compressor and the dryer element, which I didn't show you. So, give us a thumbs up guys, if you've liked it, please comment, have you had a crack at this job as well? And um, subscribe and click the bell icon if you haven't done so already. Loads more videos coming real soon. I'm hoping to get blue out of here quite soon. I just need to sort them brakes out so I can get on with a big backlog of jobs, tasks, and videos for I've got lined up for Purdy, the XK8. Happy New Year. Bye.